Hey y'all. I had a makeup and music Monday already planned to do for this week, but then Jim Steinman died. You might be going, oh, well, I don't know who that is. And the truth is you probably do, but you just don't know from where. Since I've always wanted to do a Makeup and Music Monday about Jim Steinman, and I did mention him and his influence on music in the 80s back in my 80s makeup video, I thought now's a really good time to talk about the genius that was Jim Steinman. And if that sounds like something interesting, then stick around, we'll be right back. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the makeup. We'll just talk a little bit about the makeup and then we'll get to the music. Um, today we're going to be using the SpongeBob Nautical Nonsense palette. I'm not going to be talking about the quality of it or anything. It's actually going to be in my broadcast review on Wednesday, so you can check it out there. And we're going to be using the, um, the gold highlighter from the same uh, collaboration. So Jim Steinman. This Makeup and Music Monday is not going to be your typical one, three songs and we're out because you cannot boil down Jim Steinman to three songs. His career spanned roughly 50 years. And so you can't really just boil that down to three big things that he did. I did not know until I started doing more research for this video that he had done so much more than, and been asked to do a ton of things um, that to me just sound amazing and incredible. And the fact that he crossed paths with so many incredibly important musicians over the years just blew me away. So you can't really just boil that down to, well, here's three of the most important things he did because he did so many so many things that really in the 80s literally changed the face of music. So let's start with his early career in the 60s and 70s, which is where he came up. So in the 60s, he went to Amherst College in Massachusetts. That's where he, he studied. And he wrote a musical called The Dream Engine. The Dream Engine would contain many of the themes and melodies for songs that were later recorded by other artists, such as Meatloaf and Bonnie Tyler. If, for those of you that are ahead of me, you already know that Jim Steinman and Meatloaf pretty much inextricably linked. The Dream Engine, he wanted to bring the Dream Engine to Broadway. He studied under Joe Papp, who is the founder of the New York Shakespeare Society, but also huge uh, influence on Broadway and getting anything to Broadway, to be honest. So it was an amazing opportunity for him to have access to somebody like that early on in his songwriting career. In the 1970s is when his career as a legendary songwriter pretty much um, found its voice in the artist that we know as Meatloaf or Marvin Lee Day. In the 1970s he actually had his some of his music recorded by big name people who went on to become big name artists. He had a song that was demoed. It was actually a song that ended up on the Bad Out of Hell album called Heaven Can Wait. And it was recorded by Beth, Bette Midler. Then he also had a song called Milady who, that was recorded or uh, in a demo by Barry Manilow, but ultimately Barry never used it. So he had this incredible palette of different artists who, who, loved it, who liked his music certainly well enough to put it on a demo. But he often lamented that nobody understood his music. So in 1973, his song Happy Ending was released on a Yvonne Elliman album. If you don't know who Yvonne Elliman is, you probably know her as uh, the original recording artist for the song um, I Don't Know How to Love Him from Jesus Christ Superstar. She did play Mary Magdalene in the um, Broadway show. He wrote music and lyrics that year for a musical that was called More Than You Deserve. And one of the actors in it was Marvin Aday. Or meatloaf so this is basically how they kind of came together in 1977 he was doing a workshop for a for a musical called never musical titled neverland and the, the source material had largely come from the dream engine and he was working in that workshop with marvin a day the two of them started to develop a seven song set that they 
thought, you know, they'd be able to maybe release on an album. That album would eventually become Bad Out of Hell. Three of the songs that they developed were Bad Out of Hell, All Revved Up and No Place to Go, and and Heaven Can Wait. Heaven Can Wait is the one that Bette Midler had recorded. They were trying to find somebody to record. They were trying to get a recording contract uh, somewhere for this album that they had developed this music for. So Simon mentions that he was talking to somebody, to one of the people from the workshop, Mimi Kennedy. She was saying, you know, you, your music is so complicated. Why don't you do something more simple? He was kind of like, because he had been bemoaning the idea that he couldn't, you know, that nobody seemed to understand his music or whatever. And he said, well, I don't mean to make it complicated, but you know, his music is epic. When you think about composers who are epic composers, Andrew Lloyd Webber and Tim Rice, it's almost as if they have an idea of the theater in their mind while they're writing. Otherwise, their music wouldn't be the level it is. I think that Steinman was no different, that he always had the theatrical end in mind because he was always writing theater. And she was like, yeah, but, you know, you're trying to find a commercial contract. I mean, I'm paraphrasing here. I'm not quoting. I'm not quoting her. I'm not quoting the uh, conversation. Yeah, but now we're looking for a commercial rock and roll contract, which Meatloaf had already had um, some experience with recording contracts. And I'm sure that it flummoxed them why this Bad Out of Hell album couldn't, couldn't get produced. So ultimately, with a little help from Todd Rundgren, who... Um, you might know him from the song Hello, It's Me, another 1970s performer, but who had some influence in the industry already. Label called Cleveland International that was willing to take a, a chance on them. They were able to get Bad Out of Hell done and released. But, you know, back to the conversation with Mimi Kennedy. She's like, why don't you just write something simple? Basically, she was saying, why don't you write something that appears to the pop ear of today? This is what absolutely slays me, is that even Clive Davis, the hit maker, Clive Davis, the one that was like, oh, this Barry Manilow guy, he's going to be a thing. This Whitney Houston girl, she's going to be a thing. Like, the literal star maker of Arista Records told Steinman he didn't know anything about writing music he, he just it was his stuff was garbage like how can you be so short-sighted I that is one thing I've always kind of had a lot of respect for um Clive Davis but now I'm kind of like wait a second dude how did you not see the genius in that one of your own dang artists recorded one of his songs and didn't use it I mean you didn't use it and now I kind of understand why but that was your own short-sightedness. I mean, Steinman was a freaking genius. So, but this is what Mimi, I guess, was getting at. She was like, you know, why don't you write something that's more commercial? And he, they were listening to the radio and Elvis you, Presley's I like, I want you, you, I need you, I love you was love on. You. And he was like, I heard it. And I was like, well, maybe I could write something simple like this. And he said already he had started to sing along with a, his own sort of version of that song. He went and worked on it and worked on it. And he said he kept coming back to, I want you, I need you, but there's no way I'm ever going to love you. Um, don't be sad because two out of three ain't bad. Which in the Japanese version, the title translates to 66% is enough. That was the last song that was written for Bad Out of Hell. Meat Love obviously recorded it. And that was the song that launched them from that sort of um, Soho... Uh, off-Broadway show writing, singing, recording type of combo into the mainstream. I can remember being 10 years old and hearing that song and just crying. I'd never been in love. I'd never dated anybody. I didn't know anything. But just the sheer drama and beauty of that song absolutely just gutted me. That was in 1978. Two out of three ain't bad went to number 11 on the billboard charts. But honestly, if you had if you had listened to the radio at that time, you would have thought it was a number one hit. Everybody was playing it. And there were two versions of it. There was like a long version and a short version. So that short version obviously was like three minutes, 45 seconds tight. 
And that was kind of the way radio was back in the 70s. It was three minutes and 45 seconds or you weren't getting played. They had a longer version that topped out at about five minutes that included a, one extra bridge and then an extra verse. The, all of that, all of this is available on YouTube Music. So that is two out of three ain't bad. So in 1980, there was a film that was released called A Small Circle of Friends and Jim Steinman wrote music for it. Some of the themes that were done in that orchestral score later became themes for Total Eclipse of the Heart and um, and Making Love Out of Nothing at All, which we're going to get to in a little bit. But with this, with the success of this first single and then the first album, because the first album really became kind of a cult hit. I mean, obviously people would buy albums just for one song, but Bad Out of Hell soon became among rock aficionados, soon became like this cult hit. You had to have it and you had to love it if you wanted to even say that you liked rock and roll. Like that's how um, incredibly popular it just became in the rock and roll scene. And people wanted a follow up and they started to develop one, but Meatloaf had been touring and he had some vocal problems and couldn't record the second album, which was Bad For Good. Steinman went ahead and actually recorded the vocals for that album. You know, there wasn't, he didn't have a tremendous amount of success. And also in 1981, then uh, Meatloaf did come back and record Dead Ringer, which spawned the hit Dead Ringer For Love. And it was a, it was a duet with Cher and they did a video. Now we get into 1983, where Steinman produces Bonnie Tyler's album, Faster Than the Speed of Night, for which he wrote the title track and Total Eclipse of the Heart. And this is where I say, if you thought you didn't know him, you, you definitely do. The whole turnaround bright eyes, you know, he wrote that. He actually wrote that for a play much earlier in his career, that line. It actually referenced dying in a nuclear explosion and seeing that up close. Uh, and that's sort of a product of the day where we all thought we were going to die in a, in a big blast uh, any day now, you know, because nuclear power was so scary and new. So in 1983, that song and Air Supplies Making Love Out of Nothing at All actually held the top two spots in the Billboard Hot 100. Also in 1983, Barry Manilow did his greatest hits too and the new track on it so this was kind of a, a thing that sort of they did in the 80s where an artist would release a greatest hits album and then they would put an extra track on there i mean i'm sure it was a sales uh ploy and it worked very well because i bought the album to get the extra track read em and weep read em and weep had been previously released sung by meatloaf on the dead ringer album in 1981 but it had slightly different lyrics Barry Manilow's version of Read Him and Weep went to the top of the adult contemporary chart and it stayed there for eight consecutive weeks. Here's an interesting note. So I covered this in the movie stars that had number one hits that Rick James had had an issue with MTV because he had submitted Super Freak to be played on MTV. He had submitted a video and they were like, nah, we're just going to do rock and roll, right? Eventually... I guess they came to their senses about not being racist. And they said, no, that's fine. We'll play Super Freak. We'll play other, you know, R&B music, whatever. The one thing they always did say is, we will never play Barry Manilow. Then Barry Manilow came out with Read Him and Weep and this incredibly theatrical video. MTV kind of didn't have a choice at that point, in a sense, because Bob Giraldi had produced this video. And Bob Giraldi was somebody that they kind of didn't want to tick off. He was a man with options. But that said, Bob Guaraldi, he had directed Michael Jackson's Beat It, Pat Benatar's Love is a Battlefield, Lionel Richie's Hello, and the Say 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 video with Paul McCartney and Michael Jackson. To have him on board and then for MTV to say, no, no, we don't want to play. We don't want to play that because it's Barry Manilow. Kind of like cutting off your nose to spite your face. They did actually. But with Jim Stein's genius, that had to be a success. The His music just lent itself to the theatrical. And Jim Steinman really did shape the music of the 80s. His music was so over the top and so theatrical. And it was epic, like rock music. So the rock bands of the 80s clung to it and started to emulate it. 
and that's why we have hair bands and that's why we have those big metal ballad types because Jim Steinman set the tone. It's really amazing how some artists are just born into or they are, become part of a of an era where maybe their work is not understood. But once it catches on, it's epic. It will change an entire generation of music. I mean, everybody knows about the British invasion and so on of, of the 80s. But the other sweeping change was the onset of the hair band or the hair ballad. It's a little peachy, it's a little blue, kind of like me right now. Because Jim Steinman was a big part of my life and my musical growing up, as it were. Well, in 1984, Here Comes Footloose, Holding Out for a Hero, Steinman produced and wrote that piece. It was on the Footloose uh, soundtrack. Kind of in 1983, everybody was jumping on the Jim Steinman bandwagon. Everybody wanted to record one of his songs. Understandably so. His music, if not himself and Meatloaf, his music was enjoying this like renaissance and this, this big boost in popularity. And people were starting to latch onto it and go, hey, this is some really good stuff, so take that, Clive Davis. So in 1984, maybe a year behind the whole bandwagon thing, Barbara Streisand did her Emotion album, which was produced by Steinman. And she recorded Left in the Dark which was already had been recorded by Meatloaf on the Bad For Good album. The song didn't really do anything, but it is amazing. And I'm gonna cue it up right now. I can't believe that that song did not do better than it did. The, I can remember discovering that song when I was in, in college so actually it came out while i was in high school but it, i discovered it in college that whole album that whole album is amazing but that song the way she sings it i think if she had maybe recorded it a year earlier it might have done better oh wow but that song has an amazing number of motifs that we can all identify with have we never been left in the dark by a a lover or a spouse who just wasn't doing the right thing. And I think sometimes that was just the genius of Steinman was to really be able to plug into our soul and maybe not the best part of us. Maybe the part that kind of just wants to run away or kind of just wants to not do the right thing once in a while. He seems to be able to really get into that part of us and touch that in a very, in a rather forbidden way, which I think is amazing for a composer to be able to do. According to him, he was asked to write some lyrics for Phantom of the Opera because Andrew Lloyd Webber thought that his, his dark obsession would bring that element with a deeper meaning to the show. But he says that he had to turn that down because he had a commitment to Bonnie Tyler, to a Bonnie Tyler album. And he, he, had, he was already involved in, in doing that so that, so he couldn't. So throughout the eighties, there were various recordings of re-recordings of his music. He had a tremendous amount of popularity in the eighties. He worked with Def Leppard for a little while. All the while that Jim Steinman's music is just bubbling through the eighties and his style is starting to get adopted and revised and we're getting all of this amazing theatrical music the whole time bubbling underneath for him were some legal issues that he had with meatloaf from the 70s and early 80s and everybody was saying that's great but when are we going to get bat out of hell too because everybody wanted a bat out of hell too they wanted they wanted the the same theme the same feeling as they got out of bad out of hell and i'll tell you if you have not heard bad out of hell listen to the whole album i'm normally a person who's like listen to what you want you don't have to feel compelled to buy an album one of the things that kind of ticked me off about garth brooks at one point in time was that 
he wouldn't release any of his music on the streaming services because he was like, all my music has to be enjoyed as an album. So you had to buy the album. You couldn't just buy singles. It's like, all my music has to be in, enjoyed as an album because it's a whole story. It's a whole epic. And I'm like, um, no. Because having come out of the 80s with Bad Out of Hell, I was like, no, no. Your idea of an epic and my idea of an epic and a storyline are two vastly different things, Garth. No. So the whole time, there's this whole thing bubbling with... Um, with Meatloaf and Jim Steinman, this whole legal issue and money issues going on with them. In the meantime, everybody's going, when are we gonna see Bad Out of Hell 2? It kind of started to look like we were never gonna see that. But then in, in 1989 or 90, I mean, I think it depends on your source. Over Christmas, Meatloaf and Jim Steinman met up in Connecticut at Meatloaf's house and they sang Bad Out of Hell on the piano. And I remember, the hearing that at the beginning of that year that they had kind of resolved they this this gave them an opportunity to kind of resolve their issues and that they were going to work together again and sure enough by 1993 we had bad out of hell too we had objects in the rearview mirror we had i do anything for love but i won't do that and we had rock and roll dreams come through. There were all three top 40 hits from Bad Out of Hell 2. So it's kind of crazy how they couldn't find anybody who wanted to produce Bad Out of Hell, the first one. But damn it, they didn't have three top 40 hits in Jim Steinman style. You know, not that whole like, why don't you write something more commercial? But in Jim Steinman's like epic rock, dark style, top 40, three top 40 hits by 1993 and I mean I think that's amazing. In 1996 would see Steinman's probably his last real commercial success with one of his songs which was Celine Dion's It's All Coming Back to Me Now on her Falling Into You album. He produced but he didn't author two other songs on the album River Deep, Mountain High, and Call the Man. It's All Coming Back reached number two on the Billboard chart and Steinman won BMI's Song of the Year for that song. What that award is, so if you are a composer, some of, some people already know this, some of you probably already know this, but if you are a composer uh, and you write music for others to record, like pop music or whatever, you can publish your song in the BMI catalog. And then the, compose, the singer can go and look through the catalog and choose your song, maybe, and if your song gets the most airplay that year, then you win the BMI Song of the Year Award. So then in 1996, Steinman wrote lyrics for Andrew Lloyd Webber's Whistle Down the Wind, which did not receive very good, um, did not have a very good reception when it opened in Washington, D.C., but then it got kind of reworked a bit and was, um, opened in the West End, which is London's version of Broadway. And the West End production did well. So in 2003, Meatloaf, during his Hair of the Dog tour, announced that he and Steinman would be releasing a new album. He claims that work on the album had been stalled because um, Steinman had said he was ill from a heart attack, from having had a heart attack and that he wasn't able to work on an intense album like that. Simon's manager was like, no, that's not true. That wasn't the reason why he wasn't working on the album. In 2006, Bad Out of Hell 3, which was produced by Desmond Child, was actually released. It had 14 songs, seven of which were written by Jim Steinman, and um, five of those were covers from were covers of songs that had been released on previous albums. The album went to number eight immediately on the top 200 but in like and it sold like 81,000 its first two weeks but then it sort of immediately fell three weeks in within three weeks to number 60 because a lot of the critics were kind of like but where's Jim Steinman we kind of heard this stuff before it's great that Meatloaf is recording it but where you know where is he in the rest of the album I mean, were we looking for it? We kind of were. We were like, y'all did Bad Out of Hell 2. Why not do Bad Out of Hell 3, you know? And and when we heard about it, everybody was very excited about it. I listened, I remember listening to it on a streaming service before um, 
because I wanted to hear before I bought it. And I was kind of like the same way. I was kind of like, so where's Jim Steinman's influence in this? It just didn't have it. But Meatloaf's video was amazing. As always, all of his videos, all of the videos that he did of Steinman's music were always incredible because Steinman wrote for theater and he wrote for drama and he wrote for darkness that you how do you not get something absolutely amazing out of that so as we wind up his career into the 2010s and later there were a lot of um his health fail was failing uh, there were a lot of musicals made about his music there were a lot of re-recordings of his music nothing tremendously notable here in the united states in other countries these productions were well received and very popular i'm going to go ahead and finish up my foundation and we'll be right back to wrap up. Okay, so with the release of Bad Out of Hell 3, there were a few um there were a few issues with copyright. Jim Steinman had actually copyrighted the phrase Bad Out of Hell to prevent Meatloaf from using it. So there was kind of uh, once again the artistic and legal issues that had plagued the musical couple uh showed you know, showed back up again in that. But in the end, there was a settlement that was made out of court and Meatloaf was allowed to continue with the Bad Out of Hell 3 album. So this is our final look. Um, yeah, I like that pop of blue in the middle because the passing of Jim Steinman makes me kind of sad. I enjoyed his music so much over the years, really from the time, I mean, for over 40 years, I've enjoyed his music. Um, and even though he really hasn't had any any commercial releases since about 96, it just feels sad to have that chapter come to an end. Jim Simon was brilliant. From the time that he was writing at Amherst College to the time that he was producing Celine Dion's album, he wrote for our dramatic side. He wrote for the dark in us that can't speak. He said what well, we all were thinking sometimes and his music I think provided a freedom that we weren't able to provide for ourselves. The lyric from Bad Out of Hell that I like the most is if I gotta be damned I want to be damned dancing through the night with you. I think that that's a, there's a certain amount of dark escapism in that phrase and something that and something that each of us in our darkest moments would take advantage of if we could we would get on that bike and we would be like a bat out of hell thanks for hanging out with me on this music and makeup monday i hope that you all are taking care of yourself i hope you're taking care of each other and as always i'll see you in my next one bye y'all Bleeding out my sneaks, throw my crown at your face in case you forgot I was king. I hope it leaves a mark if you forget where you're destined to be. Uh, higher than wings, flying outside a desert, Saria.